record. Ready when you are. Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, wow, there's a lot of people. Wow. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Debbie Cargason. I'm a 10 year member with Leaders Recognizing Leaders, and I'll be hosting our first ever town hall virtually today. So, Leaders Recognizing Leaders, we're an international nonprofit. We mentor our youth, we serve our communities with food drives, and we fundraise for scholarships and so, so much more. Normally, we have our annual galas every year, beautiful black tie events, and we raise money for our kids. This year, of course, not gonna happen. But we decided to, we were brainstorming and we thought, how else can we impact our community, help everyone around us? So we decided to hold these virtual town halls. Hopefully, we're gonna have more and more every month, but today we have an extremely, extremely special guest. And we have panelists, we have students, we have community members like you. And we're gonna discuss really pressing topics that we see every day. We're gonna discuss social justice, racial inequality, the global protests and reform we've seen here and around the world, and the hopefully hopeful future of our world. We have special panelists today that are going to ask questions to our special guest. We'll announce in a little bit. Um, we have students, we have community members, people who've made a difference, activists, many, many people are on with us. Um, to our audience, if you have any questions for our special guests, please in the chat at the bottom, you can type your name and your question and we'll call you at the end. So this is our first town hall again. So we give a huge, huge thank you to all our participants, our sponsors, and specifically Microsoft for giving uh, some prizes to our volunteers and our, our guests. Edwina? Yes, yeah, so I just want to say hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our call today. This is so exciting to be able to see all of you here live. We are certainly stretching ourselves to be able to connect with social media at its finest. <laughs> so special thanks to all of our speakers today. Uh, we really put this together in a moment's notice because of all of the individuals who have confirmed with us. They all have very, very busy schedules. There you go. So we all have very, very that um, we continue to have these types of conversations. And of course, as you know, we're always going to have people who are <laughs> coming in and trying to shut down the show, but we had a practice run and so we're ready for it. So special thanks to all of you um, and uh, in particular to our uh, Microsoft partner for providing us with some amazing gift cards for our class of 2020 student leaders. So thank you. All right, Debbie, back to you so I can go ahead and make sure that we keep everything rolling. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and Edwina, Edwina, this is Therese. Hi, hi, Therese. Hi, a bit, a bit concerned because this meeting has been hacked. So, uh, you know, there's no security level at this point. This meeting has officially been hacked. Okay. Um, do you have any alternative at this point? Because I am concerned. Okay, um, we... There you go. Okay. All right. So, um, Debbie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, there we go. All right, so um, we do, uh, Therese, are you there? Oh, 
Okay, I think we may okay have her. Um, um I'm here. I was on mute. Hi. <laughs> so we um we, yeah, go ahead. Have uh, any other concern at this point, or do you want us to? No, you are uh, well, you know, because Microsoft, we you know, I just have to be super careful um, and want to make sure that everybody is safe. That's my biggest concern uh, right now. And so when, when a meeting is hacked like this, I just want to make sure that there's safety. That's all. Okay. So I think we're, we're okay. <laughs> all right. And I can share my video. What's happened, ironically, at the same time, we've all had to leave our place because there is a fire. So I had to go to the car. Uh, I have no idea what's going on here. So I may just have to go on mute and uh, figure out what is happening because they are asking us now to leave the garage. I left my house and now, I'm, so give me just a quick moment because uh, I'm so excited um, awesome. that I'm not gonna allow any of these things that are happening this morning to deter us from this amazing event that you pulled together. I'm super excited. Give yes. me one quick moment. Let me speak with the fireman over here and I'm gonna get right back on just a moment. Not a problem. So with that, we're going to pass it back to Debbie and go ahead and give uh, Dr. Davis uh, Jerome an opportunity to get started. Yes, Dr. Jerome, if you could please unmute yourself and you can give our opening remarks. Well, what an exciting day this has been. Thank you. Thank you, leaders, recognizing leaders, Dr. Edwina Ward and staff. And thank you so much to UNA Broward's own Dr. Marilyn Lamech for making this collaboration possible. Hello everyone and thank you all for joining us today. I am Dr. Eileen Davis Jerome, the um, president of United Nations Association of Broward County. I'm the Southeast Regional Representative to the National Council for UNA USA a member of the Broward County Human Rights Board, a member of the Broward Refugee Task Force, international educational consultant. I'm thrilled that I have led groups to over 100 countries, all seven continents, and my passion is reaching out to youth and learning about education and cultural institutions. I'm a very old lady. My social security number here is one. Um, as a child, I was a foot soldier marching with Dr. Martin Luther King, believe it or not, on the historic March on Washington in 1963. And I'm very happy and honored to say that I hosted uh, in May, some people who are on the call now were on the call we had in May uh, for the UN 75 Broward County, Florida consultation. Um, because of what we do and because of what we're going through now, I would just ask you to bear with me for one minute with a moment of silence because uh, of what we do the UN way. We usually start out with prayer the UN way, which is silent meditation honoring all faiths. And in view of the um, deaths that we've had around the world and our concerns for all kinds of safety, may I ask for a moment of silence from all of us? Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, you yes. can. The United Nations was chartered 75 years ago to help establish collaboration and cooperation among nations for the shared goal of peace. The United Nations Association USA was established by Eleanor Roosevelt former uh, U.S. First Lady to mobilize for civic action and to promote the mission and vision of the United Nations. We here in Broward and throughout the world globally, belonging to countries that are members of the UN, uh, support the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Our mission statement, the Broward County chapter of UNA USA wants all community members to understand the work of the UN, Membership to UNA USA is your connection to the UN. As a member, you receive exclusive web content, web content, invitations to events at the United Nations, uh, the US Department of State and special chapter programming through our chapter. UNA Broward members work with the community and elected officials to inform, 
and mobilize others to support the principles and vital work of the UN by providing internships and advocating for the sustainable development goals, quality education, social justice, labor, energy, and climate change. Um, the UN is under the leadership of Secretary um, Antonio Gutierrez, and we draw connections between the local pandemics uh, that we're suffering with climate change and bridging inequalities. We are all in this together. The UN supports Black Lives Matter. We support the work of the World Health Organization, WHO. A part of the UN 75th anniversary, and for the purposes of our chapter, we're including you in our celebration because today is indeed a celebration working with LRN. The questions we have asked is what kind of future do we want to create? Are we on track to secure a better world? What action is needed to help to achieve a brighter future? And you, as global leaders of today and tomorrow, will help us to continue answering these questions by sharing your thoughts and suggestions via our discussions of how to empower young people to learn about youth engagement, race relations, and human rights. Now, when we had our consultation, areas of concern that we felt we would like to see addressed, less conflict, better access to health care, more respect for human rights, more environmental protection, better access to education, better management of international migration, more sustainable consumption and production, more employment opportunities, greater equality within countries and between countries, greater equality between men and women. UNA USA is proud that we as an organization have over 20,000 members, more than 200 chapters just in the US. We are a part of WFUNO, the World Federation of UN Associations, and we invite all who are on the call, all globally, to become a part of our organization and to continue these discussions long after we finish today. I will put in our uh, chat a link for those who would like to join, membership for those students 25 and under, absolutely free. Introductory membership in the US for our adults uh, is $25. So with that being said, I just want to say major responsibility. If you're old enough, be sure you register and vote. If you're in the USA, be sure you finish that census, the US census. And God help all of us throughout the world. Thank you for the youth of today and those on this call. I yield. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Jerome. Thank you so much. Now we open up the floor to Dr. Perrin Sabajnu. She is one of our chairs. So please take it away. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining uh, this one wonderful session with our uh, group of speakers lending their valid and much needed expertise during these times. My name is Dr. Paran Sabunju and I am the Vice President of LRL. Um, I would like to introduce the founder and president of LRL, Edwina ward -Seschleck. Uh, she, Her vision continues to inspire everyone and um, I'm very happy to bring this forward to her. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Perrin Sabuchu. You know, I just want to say thank you all for everyone participating. Uh, the, the mission and the purpose of Leaders Recognize Leaders is to teach youth and young adults ages 15 through 25 how to be leaders and young diplomats, reshaping their mindset for community service, educational development, and global communication in local, national, and international communities. This organization has such an exciting opportunity to connect with great partners such as the UNA, simply because our mission statement is definitely one that we can connect to and we can relate to because our goal is to continue to work together as one in one fashion. Um, so the organization uh, is located in Nashville, Tennessee, our founding location. We have a chapter in Ghana, Africa. 
Uh, we also have a chapter here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We're so excited to continue to expand our outreach, super excited to always have great partners such as Microsoft, who has been very supportive over the years. And of course, the very unique and significant namesake, Mr. Ndaba Mandela, who will join us very later on in the call. So just wanna say thank you all for your participation. Thank you for all of our team members. This work, you could not have done this by yourself. It is definitely a team effort. And so I just wanna welcome you all to the call and thank you for our collaboration with Dr. Eileen. Also, thank you to Dr. Lamarck for participating and making sure that we all get involved and come together as one. So thank you all and welcome. Thank you, Edwina. Now I know Mr. Mandela is joining us in a little bit. Do we have trees available with Microsoft yet? I don't think she's back on. Should we go on? Yes, you do. Uh, we're going to plow straight forward, but yes, I uh, am going to hang on here just for a little bit longer. And uh, thank you so much. Phenomenal opening. Go ahead, Ms. Johnson. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you. Well, you know, so this is a testament that, uh, that we don't allow uh, any circumstance to get in the way of opportunity for us to uh, empower one another. Uh, it's been interesting that this morning, uh, as I stated earlier, and I apologize for a little bit of this disruption, we are very big on uh, security safety. So apologize this morning for some of the, the things that uh, occurred uh, on the call. And then on top of that, at the same time, we were trying to uh, deal with the, a little bit of a personal matter that all popped up at the same time here. But we're going to continue to plow away. I have a mobile. I'm safe. I came to a park and uh, was able to get out safely, and then we'll go back and deal with uh, what's going on in just a moment. But again, all a true testament to the power of technology. And that is really what, uh, you know, when Edwina and I were talking, what the big focus has been, LRL has been on the front lines, making sure that when it comes to human rights, when it comes to all of the things that we're seeing going on around us, uh, the importance of us plowing forward to say that we know that education, that our ability to have access to technology, that the ability for us to make sure globally all around the world, in fact, I just got off of a call with our colleagues in uh, Johannesburg uh, to talk about a huge initiative that they want to do with women. There's a lot of things going on with women now. And, um, and our goal really uh, globally all over the world is to make sure that women and children and all of those that don't have access, uh, that we are empowering them as an organization, meeting them right where they're at. And so you're going to see us really talk about from entrepreneurship, from empowerment um, around businesses, building uh, from new ideas, uh, and the ability really to partner. Uh, I know that I've been able to even work with Ndaba in past. Uh, they had a huge initiative to build the next 100 Mandela's. And so really rethinking and reshaping how it is that young people enter the market and the power that you own and that you have to really consider how artificial intelligence, how machine learning, how all of those algorithms can be made available to you uh, really for free. And a lot of these cases to go off and learn uh, and really start to understand the power that you own and that you have to move the nation, move the world when it comes to our freedoms and then the educational access, technology access that affords us that. And so I can't thank you enough, 100%. Uh, again, the openings have been amazing. Um, we want to do so much more. You're going to see an article that I can actually paste uh, in the chat window where Microsoft announced two days ago that we are going to be skilling up 25 million people globally all over the world giving access uh, to free tools, technologies to move them towards this digital era. And so this is really all the start of economic empowerment globally uh, to empower our women, empower our children, empower our communities, uh, which there's a huge significant gap in the market um, because of access, because of uh, all the things that we need to think about and deliver to make sure that we equalize the system. And so again, Again, can't thank you enough. Uh, really love the work that all of you are doing at LRL to make all of this possible. Edwina, we're going to continue this amazing partnership. And I know that Ndaba is going to come along and share all the great work that he continues to do as well.
So thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so grateful uh, for this program today. I'm gonna hand it right back over to you and, uh, and I'm here for any questions anyone has. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Okay, the time has come, everybody. I'm excited. Coming all the way from South Africa, one of our very, very special guests and supporters of LRL. He's the co-founder and chairman of both the Mandela Institute for Humanity and Africa Rising Foundation, the founder of the Mandela Project, author of Going to the Mountain, Life Lessons from my grandfather, Nelson Mandela, and of course, the grandson of the late, great Nelson Mandela. Mr. Ndaba Mandela, welcome. I see you. He's muted. Do you know how to end? There you go. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me, guys. Thank you so much. Um, I know you wanted to give a few comments on your views, your beliefs, so take the floor. Thank you very much. I think the world will never be the same after COVID-19. I think it is a time that has come where each of us need to stand up and be counted. You have in America the elections coming up this year in November, and it is very important that young people understand their role that they play in their community and the influence that they have and how the world develops in the future. Now the cracks of the system have come to the surface and we realize that the so-called professors, presidents, ministers, they don't have all the answers. So it is up to young people to take active participation in making sure that they are involved in the decision-making processes that choose our leaders. I mean, right now, we have a situation in the world where we don't have enough good leaders. And so it is vitally important for young people to be able to equip themselves to then take up leadership positions. We as society need to inspire young people to become the change they wanna see. And that change starts within themselves, in their homes, where they go to school, um, and it's really about making sure that each of us take responsibility for what is happening in our society. So, and that begins, ladies and gentlemen, by voting when it comes this November. Thank you, Mr. Mandela. Jay, are you on? Hi, yes. Thank you so much, Mr. Mandela, for your, first off, being here and for your remarks and for, um, pouring into us today. Um, our first part of our town hall, we have two panelists that will have their remarks and they will have questions for Mr. Mandela. And after the discussion, we're gonna have these two panelists, students and other community leaders who will get the opportunity to uh, ask questions of Mr. Mandela, which is the opportunity of a lifetime. So our first, uh, panelist that we have coming up is Mr. Lawrence Wilson. He is the CEO and co-founder of the Wilson brand here in Texas. Um, Mr. Wilson, please take it away. Are you on? All right, while we wait for Mr. Wilson, I'm going to introduce our second panelist, who is Womi Ojo, who is the founder of the Imani Health Foundation based out of Lagos, Nigeria. Womi, are you on? Don't forget to unmute yourself. God, can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me? Yes. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, this is such an awesome opportunity, like being here and being able to talk to everybody. Um, yes, I am currently not in Lagos. I am currently in the western part of Nigeria. I'm in Ocean State for Project for Imani Health Foundation. And um, this topic of human rights, race relations, and young people couldn't have come at a better time, I believe. Um, Mr. Ndaba, thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. Um, you are such 
an awesome, magnificent person. So thank you for being here with us. Um, so I'll just talk briefly on what we do. I know I have like three to four minutes. So Imani Health Foundation is based out of Nigeria, yes. Um, we do our primary projects in Nigeria, and we recently just had our first project in Rwanda. But what we do is we try our best to educate and empower adolescents and women um, in Africa. And we, our focus is on sexual abuse, sexual assaults. Um, you know, when it comes to human rights and equality, there's a culture of silence. Um, I, I'll speak for Nigeria. There is a culture of silence when it comes to rape, gender-based violence, and everything under it, which is sexual assault, domestic violence. And um, this, this started, we started working in 2015, and we noticed a gap in research especially amongst adolescents, and a lack of education when it comes to gender-based violence. And so what we do is, instead of waiting you know, for our government to do something, we actually go to grassroots communities um, and speak one-on-one -on -one with adolescents. So, so we're speaking not even just adolescents. A child could be six, seven years old, and you know, we have to let them know and educate them from that age that some, some things are certainly not acceptable. And the way our culture is set up, we have become very, very used to certain things, um, which kind of mutates and grows into um, other, you know, just things that are not acceptable. And so right now, yesterday, we had a project in one of our remote areas, which is actually my hometown in the West. And we spoke with 23 young people. Of course, we were socially distanced, um, talked to them about the pandemic and how to keep safe. Um, but the questions that they had themselves was actually very, not alarming, but it, 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 cre it shows that there is a need to educate. Education is key. I had um, a 25-year-old just ask me a question like, okay, if somebody tells me that I just got assaulted, what do I do? Um, how do I react to that? And I had to let them know that, you know, you have to play your part. It's not easy, but you have to try your best, play your part. And part of what we do is to let them know about consent. We give them um, information sheets on what to do if someone has told you they've been assaulted. And we let them know that it's very important. It's actually very, very important to tackle the issue of sexual assault and everything gender-based violence because there's a ripple effect that can mentally affect you as an adult. So it's important that we tackle that right now, today. And part of what we do as well is to empower young people. So just like what Mr. Um, Indaba just said about our responsibility to empower young people, to educate them, it is very important because at our event out outreach yesterday, I had another child ask me, okay, I finished high school, I finished um, university, what next? The opportunities are not here because look at our area, it's very remote. And so we're also thinking of starting a mentorship program and trying to see how we can create opportunities for young people. But I mean, like I said, this topic, human rights, race relations and young people, it could not have come at a better time. So I'm very, very honored to be um, here today. So I guess my question, to Mr. Ndaba is I know that you do a lot of um, things when it comes to human rights, but how is the climate when it comes to gender-based violence and um, sexual violence? And how, how do you tackle, how do you tackle that, especially with the pandemic? There was a rise statistically, there was a rise in gender-based violence and domestic violence in Nigeria. Um, so how have you guys been able to tackle that? If you have, how has that been you know, um, addressed? Can you hear me? Okay. So, uh, unfortunately, it has actually been a major problem here in South Africa, and there's several campaigns uh, that you'll hear on radio, TV, um, across the nation, even billboards, you know, trying to conscientize, you know, mostly men to say, guys, we need to protect it. this gender-based violence has increased uh, in, in the homes. Because, you know, 
came to South Africa, they even uh, disallowed the sale of alcohol. Now, when you look of uh, of gender independent organization, but government needs to come to the party. You know, corporates need to come to the party as, as well as civil society. And we need to have outlets for young people. You know, if they've been now exposed to this at the home between their mother and their father, where do they go? What is their outlet? Who do they vent to? Who is their, you know, mentor? Where do they get help? Um, and I think there's not enough discussions around where do women and children go who do not have an outlet, who don't have other family members, you see? So I think we need to, we need to discuss this even more as a society. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mandela. Thank you, Ms. Ojo. Thank you for your contributions to Nigeria and all you do for those, for those young people. So now we're gonna open the floor to Q&A to our students, our young leaders, our activists, our community members, anyone who has logged on to, who's interested in asking a question. So my first person I'd like to spotlight is Mr. Travis Miller. Mr. Travis, um, your video went viral last month in May. You were making a delivery, you were doing your job and in Ohio, is that correct? In a gated community? And upon trying to leave, your, you know, your duty, the association's president blocked you. For some reason, he didn't believe you were working or what, what are, can you just tell us the story? And then if you have a question for Ms. Mandela, the floor is yours. Excuse me. Hello everyone, uh, Travis Miller Sr. here. Um, my, my incident actually took place in Oklahoma City Oklahoma, uh, where we're currently residing at with me and my family. Um, I am a truck delivery driver, delivering appliances and furniture to either commercial or residential properties. Um, on that particular day, I was doing all residential uh, home deliveries and um, had actually completed my last delivery of the day, but it was in a gated community. Um, so the roadways were smaller, not of the same size as your average uh, average streets and roadways. And I was driving a uh, tractor trailer combo, uh, but not the regular 53 foot tractor trailer. I was driving the short 28 foot tractor trailer. So um, this particular area, they had a lot of uh, low hanging trees. And being that I'm in a, I was in a uh, tractor trailer, um, it's not uncommon for the top of the trailer to brush up against some branches or break some trees, uh, branches. Um, and we did happen to snap one, but the homeowner didn't have a problem with it. He actually picked a branch up that we unfortunately broke, pulled it onto his property to be disposed of later. But um, the president of the homeowners association uh, got, I guess, got wind of it because his wife was driving the car behind me. Um, she saw it, went home and told him, and he came out to immediately confront me and um, asked a ton of questions that had nothing to do with any reason why I was there. Um, he didn't express an issue with the truck being in there or the size of the truck. Uh, his issue that he was expressing was um, who was driving the truck and the other occupant in the truck. So, you know, I figured I need to get out of there as fast as possible. So I had to make a U-turn. So I had to drive further into the, uh, into the, uh, to, to the area to find an area so I can turn around. And as I completed my U-turn, he drove down and blocked me and the truck in. And um, the state that I live in, Oklahoma, is an open carry state. It's a constitutional carry state. So Basically, you don't need a permit to carry a gun. So I had to have that in my mindset, like, you know, the guy is clearly smaller than me. He can clearly see that I'm a big individual. Um, he was able to read my name off my shirt. So he just, just kept trying to, uh, I'm sorry, kept trying to just ask me a ton of questions as far as what was I doing there? How did I get a gate code to get in? 
Um, where was I going? Who did I deliver to? Questions that was really none of his business. Um, in order to get in, into that community, into that gated community, I had to enter the gate code that the customer who I delivered to provided to my company in order for me to get in. And um, him and, and a buddy of his came down and same thing happened. They kept asking me questions. So the whole ordeal, I was able to record about 37 to 40 minutes of it, but the entire thing probably lasted about uh 50 minutes to an hour um between the stuff that happened off camera and the stuff that happened on camera and um it was just a unnecessary situation that didn't have to happen um but if he felt like i was he basically he felt like i was trespassing that i had no business and i had no right to be there um not that i didn't have a right to make the delivery but i me, the person, the individual, didn't have a right to be there. So um, to protect myself, uh, in case he called the company and said I did something or said something I didn't say, I decided to record. When he said that he was calling the police, I decided to go live just in case things escalated and went sideways and south and, um, and, and you know, with everything that's been happening and going on uh, with black men or people of color in this country, I just wanted to make sure that I protected myself and make sure that I got home to my family. Um, thankfully, I was able to do such as. Thank you, Mr. Miller. We're gonna repost your video on our Instagram. I'm so sorry that happened to you. Do you have any questions for Mr. Mandela? Um, First, it's a pleasure to be uh, on this uh, call with you. Um, I don't know exactly what question I can have right now. Maybe I can ask one a little later on. Um, but to, to see the continued work that you're doing from the legacy that, that your grandfather has set, um, my hat's off to you and kudos to you. And, you know, pleasure to meet you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Travis. I really appreciate it. and. Um, you know, kudos to you for for having the mind to you know go live with your recording on on your, on your mobile phone, and uh, uh, thank God you came out of them one piece, brother. Thank you for for being with us today. Yeah, it, it you know I had to you know stay in the truck to stay mm -hmm. safe because you know had I gotten out the truck and he did have a gun then the narrative would have been I was an aggressive black man yeah. when I would have gone from being the victim to traitor. And, um, I made a promise to my wife and I have two young, beautiful children that I would come home every night. You know, I get up to go to work to make sure that I come home so that I can provide for them. So it's like a wash, rinse, re repeat for me. And, you know, it was, Tough ordeal, tough situation. You know, I was dealing with a multiple deaths in the family. Um, so my mindset could have really, if I didn't that, you know, I could have been reactive instead of proactive and God knows how that would have ended up. And, you know, I could have been another hashtag in between Ahmaud, Brianna and George. And, you know, when I think of it, it talk to me and guide me through that situation at that time. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Miller, for your story. Right. Send it over to, we have Mr. Cody Hebel. He has a couple questions for Mr. Mandela. Go ahead, Cody. Um, yeah, I was wondering um, how we could uh, diplomatically influence people such as our peers to make better choices in life without coming off as judgmental or confrontational? Well, I think what's important um, whenever you're dealing with a, a, another, an opposition, essentially, um, is to be able to agree on simple facts, you know, um, we talk about the slave trade, we talk about the amount of money that they contributed to companies that still exist today. 
right? Um, so when you talk about reparations, you're talking about something that is real, that is tangible, where there's proof, there's a paper trail, right? So if we're having an argument, ladies and gentlemen, we need to agree that this is a table and not a chair, right? Because if we're not able to, to agree on the simple facts and acknowledge what has happened in the past, then there's no ways of us going to be able to move forward. So I believe that we need to, it's, we need to get over ourselves and, 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 and come to a realization that this world, everybody needs to play their part, right? We are all equal under the law. Um, and if the states or there are corporates or entities or parties uh, that feel otherwise, then I believe it's time for America to have that difficult conversation about the white elephant in the room. Yes, you know, the end of slavery came and you had the Emancipation Proclamation, but there were no measures put in place to make sure that racism would continue. We brushed it under the table and said, okay, let's go back to our normal lives. So for me, it's about having a honest, serious, conversation and acknowledging the facts of what happened before we can actually move on. Thank you so much, Mr. Mandela. Thank you so much, Mr. Mandela, for, for that advice and for those great words. Up next, we're going to have one of LRL's uh, students, Ms. Taylor, I'm sorry, Ms. Taylor Pittman, who is the class of 2020. Taylor, go ahead and take it away, ask your question. Thank you. Uh, hi, Mr. Mandela. It honestly is such an honor um, to be speaking to you and asking you this question. Um, I'm 18 years old and for a long time, I've had to face my own sense of prejudice within my own community, going to primary, predominantly white institutions and schools and just having to grow up around that and not always being able to fit in with, with the white crowd as well as the black crowd. So my question to you is based on your legacy, how would you advise a young person such as myself to handle prejudice once faced with it, especially when it's dealing with an adult specifically? Um, dealing with as an adult or dealing with it versus an adult? Versus an adult. You see, it's. Uh, it's very difficult to be honest as a child going up against an adult, right? So it's important that young people have mentors, right? Have good relationships with their parents or people um, in their families that care about them. You know, unfortunately, uh, these days, um, you know, young people tend to run to each other as opposed to going to a, you know, the older generation. So it's important that young people actually come together and come up with ways in which young people can actually get these issues to other people so that they can come back and deal with them. Now, when you're going up against an adult as a child, there's very little that you're gonna actually be able to accomplish, right? Because let's, let's just face it, this is a, 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 a situation of David versus Samson, right? Um, so for me, I think the, 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 obviously at home, that conversation, at school, that conversation is important, right? But you need to try, if you can, not be alone, right? So when you're walking, you know, home to the library, try and make sure that you're not alone. Um, because a lot of the times, you know, there's, he said, she said, it's one-on-one, -on -one, you can't really tell. What was, what was really happening. So it's important that young people stick together um, during these situations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next question from Dr. Tita Banks. Dr. Banks. Oh, thank you for calling on me. And I want to first say congratulations to the organization and especially to uh, Dr. Eileen for assisting in putting this together. I'm with the UNA USA and also the World Federation. 
uh, of UNAIDS. Uh, Mr. Mandela, thank you so much for being uh, with us today. And to let you know that this, I'm hoping that this will be a first step. And just as you said, in terms of intergenerational, uh, young people need to be able to have mentors. We need to collaborate with other organizations so that no one is doing this by themselves. So whether we're talking about an individual being in an, in an isolated situation, whether we're talking about our black men being in isolated situations, that we are at a time where no matter what country we're in, now it is a racial pandemic. We already knew that, but now mm -hmm. you know it's opening up uh, because of the media. But now that we have opened up that wound in terms of racism uh, globally, and certainly we saw it years ago in, uh, with the Soweto uh, children, and we've seen it periodically in other countries. Now I think that we can come together and recognize that racism is a pandemic in itself and that we have to address it, whether we're talking about truth and reconciliation commissions, which were held in South Africa, which I participated in in Liberia, it's time for the US to do that. But again, that's a systemic issue. Uh, and one of the things that I did wanna add is that part of the reason that it's gonna be so difficult to change uh, the system is because we don't have enough people in those upper level positions. That's one of the things we, I worked on with uh, Mrs. Uh, Maki Mandela in terms of gender violence in South Africa. So we could train the women and we could give them the information, but we needed to again have leaders, develop leaders who would be in those judge positions, in the law enforcement positions, in the government positions. So leadership development is what I'm hoping will be uh, one of the major steps that this collaboration will work on. Uh, how do we train them? How do we uh, equip them to take on these positions so that they become part of uh, that system we're trying to change because it's going to have to not only come from the external pressure, but also from internally as we have people in positions that can make those changes. So I'm looking forward to the great things that all of you will be doing as you move forward. You're already leaders. Now it's a matter of taking on that extra mantle. How do we position you to be elected to certain positions? How do we position you to take on uh, and carry on the legacy of certain already organized situations so that you become a force that we can, we can count on to uh, you know, step in and help those changes that we're trying to do from the grassroots to make sure it goes all the way up the chain of command. So my question to Mr. Mandela uh, very quickly is, how do you see now that we, you know, we talked about Pan-Africanism ever since Du Bois, okay, and Garvey. So now we are truly in the age of Pan-Africanism as these challenges are facing us. How do you see young people uh, gaining those leadership skills and how do we see organizations helping young people move into those and create positions of leadership? Right. Um well, I believe that there are many uh, leadership courses um, and, you know, even in university colleges, different levels, even for corporate CEOs, et cetera, et cetera. Now we, an organization, um, our organization is called the Manila Institute for Humanity that's based in New York. We have come up with a framework uh, that we call the 100 Mandalas uh, that uh, Trice Johnson was, was talking about earlier on. And here, we want to really inspire young people to look for the Nelson Mandela within. We believe that the world would be a better place if we had more Mandelas. So rightfully, like you said, how do we inspire young people to understand the values of Nelson Mandela and go out there and actually lead in the very same way? So we wanted, we have created a framework where young people travel to South Africa and get to walk along the footsteps of Nelson Mandela. But of course, this was pre-COVID, right? Now, it's a, it's a different story and we're obviously looking at ways and how we're gonna translate this uh, and make it an online program. The idea was to take about 20, 25 young people every year from America and different parts of the world to come and have training about the style and the leadership of Nelson Mandela and how they can apply that in their daily lives at home, in their workplaces, 
uh, their organizations, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I believe one thing that young people need to do more of is actually support each other. We need to work together. We need to create spaces uh, because what I see is that there's a lot of competition. You know, young people are not supporting other young people. So that's one thing I think needs to change in order for us to be able to take this to the next level and really get young people to get involved in, in, in public service. You know, kids should know that it's not just about voting for a president, but your mayor, your councillors, your representatives in the community, right? Why are there no young people working in those uh, public posts? Uh, because the young people don't really connect with it anymore. So we need to find ways to get young people to be involved and help them to work together and support each other. Thank you, Mr. Mandela. Final question from our Q&A. Mr. Radar Jones, I see lots of very strong points in the chat. If you can just ask one question to Mr. Mandela, go ahead. Uh, no, um, just like I stated, I believe that like uh, pe black and people of color are victim of uh, taxation without representation. Meaning that like uh, we have like a bunch of white people who get in the room and who are going to make like decision for black people. People who never experience racism to the extent to which like uh, uh, gentlemen like Travis or myself who are who were arrested at gunpoint have experienced, but they're going to make decision for the positive change on my behalf without me in the room to pretty much share my story. And uh, this, like, what do you make of it? That's the first uh, part. The second part is that we talk about uh, leadership, building leader, but I see a lot of strong-minded, intelligent, black leaders. So my question is always, is it a lack of leadership or a lack of access? That's my question, access to a position of high power. And you talk about the fact that like uh, black people don't uh, support each other. Well, but that's, that's kind of a dominant white racial dynamic what, that we internalize, talking about individualism. Do you think that I have a point in saying that? Thank you very much. Well, brother, we need to be the ones to change the system. We need to stand up and be counted. So that vote is very important because that vote determines who is going to be a leader and who's going to make the decisions that are going to be affecting you. Of course, we cannot allow the system to make decisions on our behalf because they know nothing about us, right? But we need to organize ourselves so that we can choose the right person to go and represent us at those high levels. But right now, unfortunately, there are no young people who even want to think about going into the field of politics, right? Every kid dreams of having a tech company and you know selling out and then getting a Ferrari, right? And having a good time. They don't think about how our world is governed, you know, how we are ruled in society and how even the way we, we communicate, where our kids are, the schools, et cetera, is organized, is all done you know, under the rule of the domination of the white man. Now, like you said, my brother, yes, there are good leaders out there, right? I believe we need more good leaders, and we also have an issue of access. So it's both that leadership and access is an issue. We need young people to be brave, to be confident, right? To be smart, to be sober, right? And make the right decisions. But we need to make sure that they have the resources to be able to have those tools in order for them to break the cycle of poverty and a system that's consistently trying to kill us and get rid of us, right? Because now, they think that they're done with the Negro, and so they can dispose of the Negro. Unfortunately, 
they have to realize that 400 years has been, you've been trying to exterminate us, and we're still here. You understand? So you are forced to deal with us, and we should not ever look the other way. And I wanna, you know, encourage young people that we are no longer going to turn the other cheek. We're no longer gonna turn a blind eye. You must stamp out prejudice, whether it exists in your home when you're watching TV or whether you're walking down the streets. We all need to be courageous and we need to stamp out that ugly face of prejudice wherever we see it. And if we are scared in that situation, tell somebody about it. Do not let that situation go. So I think the short and long of it is that we need to take responsibility. We need to stand up and be counted and we need to work together because only through unity and solidarity are we going to be able to achieve our goals and bring solutions to these challenges that we're facing today. Uh, may I ask like an, an additional question very quick? Uh, I, uh, uh, I believe that you didn't grow up in this culture. So I didn't. And uh, why, where do I go with that? It's easier said than done. Why? Because I've been teaching for nine years, African-American uh, and uh, people of color. And I sometimes wonder when I see the trauma, what I would have been like in terms of like this kind of like feeling this inner power, this self-knowledge, that kind of grounded me in believing in things that you believe. I sometimes ask myself if I will have the same knowledge of self and love of self and this strong belief if I grew up in this culture and received that trauma. And that's why like, I respectfully will say that like, it's easier said than done. Why? Because I believe in mental slavery. In mental slavery that personally I don't experience because I didn't grow up in this culture. But the people who experience the transgenerational trauma experience that and it prevents them to have like this big vision of unity. That was just a comment. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mandela, our participants, our students, our volunteers. Mr. Mandela, we hear you, we feel you, we're inspired by you and your family's incredible legacy. Now we all feel we have this huge duty to uphold social justice, not only for ourselves, our families, but our brothers and sisters, like Mr. Miller, Mr. Jones, who face these things every day. It's, uh, it's, it's tough. It's really tough. To, to see all this happening today in 2020. So thank you again. We're just gonna have closing words from Ms. Johnson at Microsoft and we're good to go. Ms. Johnson? Is it possible that Eileen can say a couple of things as well? Absolutely, go ahead. I want to thank Mr. Mandela and all of the panelists on behalf of UNA USA and I'm thrilled that our fearless leader from UNA USA, our uh, president and uh, Wafuna leader as well, uh, the Honorable Dr. Tita Banks for being here. I just want to add that having worked for many years with both the New York City Public Schools um, and having visited the schools in South Africa over the years, I hear and feel what you're saying. And I truly believe that our communities are rich with culture and that whatever we do in the schools, including the Mandela School projects in New York, that keeping the community involved, keeping the churches and uh, religious organizations involved and making sure that our students always have role models. Here in Broward County, UNA Broward is collaborating with the NAACP, uh, the Urban League, and many other cultural organizations in bridging inequalities. But we sit at the feet of Nelson Mandela and what's happened with Bishop Tutu, who has visited here and who we visited with, um, with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So we thank you for that legacy. And I am open to working with you on an ongoing basis. Please keep in touch. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And yes, you have the globe behind you because you are the world. Thank you, my brother. 
Thank you, my son of freedom and the revolution for being a role model for our children. God bless you and keep on doing what you're doing. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. This is Dr. Brown Felder. I want to say thank you as well. Again, to see you and to see how well you are working and you have our total support from LRL as you know. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Ms. Trish Johnson? Or Edwina, Dr. Ward? Wow, this has been such an exciting experience to be able to bring everyone together and to be able to do what we do best, which is to communicate and to be able to engage in a very, very important conversation. So I wanna thank uh, my dear friend and Daba for participating. You definitely uh, really inspired us to continue to be great, to reach the high levels of leadership um, that your grandfather has uh, done so well. And uh, we want to share this opportunity for the persons who were our speakers. I'm actually asked a question today. I'm excited to share that they will receive one of Indaba's books. So after this call, we'll make sure, Indaba, that they get one of your books. It's called Going to the Mountain. And it actually shares a little bit about um, your work. So thank you to um, our persons who asked the question. You'll make sure you get um, a book. And, and Daba, do you want to say anything a little bit about the book before I wrap up? Well, I just want to say I wrote this book in 2018 um, when it came out, when it was released, um, really to you know connect Nelson Mandela to the next generation of leaders. You know, we know Nelson Mandela as a, as a revolutionary leader, as a president, statesman, but I wrote this book from the perspective of him being a grandfather because all of us can relate to having a grandparent. And I talk about how I moved in with him from the age of 11 years old, and he was such a, a disciplinarian. He was such a figure in my life. Um, and. So I wanted to, to share that with the world and hopefully inspire the next generation of, uh, of Mandalas, uh, not just in Africa, not just in South Africa, but across the world, because I believe that there is another Mandela on the horizon. Most definitely. So I'm so looking forward to um, us continuing this conversation. Uh, for all of our class of 2020 students who are with us, we want to make sure that we uh, celebrate you as well. Uh, for our class of 2020 participants, we have some really exciting uh, gift cards for you. So we'll make sure that you receive a gift card so that you can start working on your college planning or life after high school. Uh, and this was actually supported um, through the donations of Microsoft. So this is a nice $100 gift card and uh, you can go ahead and take care of your educational desires. <laughs> so with that being said, I just wanna say thank you to Dr. Eileen um, for your engagement. Thank you to our team members. Special thanks to Dr. Gwendolyn Brown Felder, who's on our call. Special thanks to all of the individuals for me uh, in Nigeria. We certainly look forward to working on other projects with you. And um, with that, we just wanna say thank you all for your participation. If you would like to continue the dialogue, please make sure that you uh, send us a message. Uh, you can email us, send us a message. We're gonna continue this work. Uh, and thank you all, and I can pass it back on to Debbie. I can't have the final word. Mr. Mandela needs the final word. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> thank you again. Thank you. This has been a really amazing uh, talk and engagement. I, I thank everybody, all the panelists, all the guests, all the organizers uh, for putting this uh, together. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, like I said before, for the first time in history, the Black Lives Matter is no longer something confined to America, but has sparked protests and marches across 16, 17 different nations, all shouting, the name of George Floyd, shouting for justice, shouting for equality and freedom. So this is a moment of truth for America, ladies and gentlemen. 
as we come closer to that election in November. This is the moment of the truth. Let us do things because we know it's the right thing. The time for us to truly get what we want and what we deserve is here. And so we cannot <clears throat> stop. We cannot take a break. We need to push harder than we've ever pushed before. And it's going to take every single one of us to participate in making sure that we drive this thing to where it needs to go, where people of color, different cultures are accepted and seen and protected under the same law. Ladies and gentlemen, go out there and let us do our ancestors proud and let us do ourselves proud by standing on the right side of history. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. And this concludes our session for today. Thank you. Thank you all for your participation. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elvina. Thank you, Perrin. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Angelica. Thank you, everyone, for being here. So good to see you all. Thank you.